कॉन्फिडेंस फील होगा Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj ji, how are you? Fine, thank you. I hope Hare you Krishna. You are... uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Please accept my most humble obeisances, Maharaj. Request to Prabhupada Maharaj. Bimla Prasad Das Maharaj, your humble servant. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So, so we are we are very uh, fortunate to have His Holiness Yadunanda Swami Maharaj in between us, and who would be uh, leading us through the Isha Upanishad. And Maharaj is, uh, uh, apart from being an educator, uh, this another side of Maharaj, Mar Maharaj is a prolific writer also. And there is a very indigenous work, research work Maharaj has done for, not just for ISKCON, but for the whole uh, Gaudiya Vaishnava community as of now. Uh, is a book by Maharaj, uh, Sanyas in the Modernity. So like how the ashram of Sanyas is, is coping with the modern world. And uh, that's a very candid book. Uh, I mean, I, I, I strongly by way. So, Prabhuji, you're breaking. You're breaking. Like, based on the Sanyasis. I'm trying as much as I can. <laughs> uh, is, 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 is everybody else is uh, fine with my, Okay, now it's unstable. <laughs> so, I, okay, I'll just repeat. So, that, that book, uh, Sanyas in Modernity by his Swami Maharaj, it's a very indigenous research paper document, which is not just valuable for the Sanyas, actually, it's meant for the whole community. It's based on the Sanyasis, but it is meant for the whole community of devotees. So if you can lay your hands on that book, which is very hard to find, I found my copy from Maharaj himself. He lent me his own copy actually. So, and uh, that is one area. And Maharaj is also instrumental, very much instrumental in Belgium for the Radhesh uh, Bhaktivedanta College. So that is one of, uh, the, as one of the oldest projects, I would say, uh, for ISKCON um, outside of India, uh, leading in education. And uh, Maharaj, I have my some personal, um, I mean, my uh, good fortune of interacting with Maharaj during our Bhaktivedanta course. So uh, you can take full advantage. And uh, Maharaj is actually very hard to catch. So you, uh, all of you, I would urge to take full advantage of that Sangha. And with that, I, uh, without much further ado, I hand it over to His Holiness Yadunan Swami Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you very much, Bhimla Prashad Prabhu, for your kind and generous introduction. Uh, just if I may ask before we, we, we enter into the class, just some practical questions, which maybe I should have communicated previously with Jagya Danista Prabhu, but maybe you can guide me on that. Um, I was told that the lessons are two hours and a half approximately, right? From 7 to 9.30 p.m. in India, correct? So it's supposed to be, Maharaj, like uh, two hours, but like you can stretch it. If, if you feel that, like, okay. if you need to stretch it, you can stretch it. Okay, it's seven to nine. Basically. Okay. Yeah, Maybe. but if you wish to, if you feel that it is to be stretched, then you may, you may take that liberty. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, and, and another question is, 
do you usually, I like to follow the, the practice of the Institute I'm teaching for. So do you, within these two hours or two, two hours plus, do you take a break in the middle, like five, 10 minutes? Or yeah, not? yeah, it's the five minutes break. It's a five okay. minutes break, you can do okay. five minutes break. Good, so, okay, so, and usually what I have been doing, of course, it depends on which courses, but if it's okay with all of you, we can start with Srila Prabhupada's Chaya Radha Madhava. Is that okay? Yeah, as you as, as wish, yes, why not? Why it's not? a nice way of starting. Mm -hmm. We can do that every day. Yes, ma'am. Start punctually with Srila Prabhupada's bhajan. And, and we can, of course, join muted into the, the kirtan. Muted. Our own places. And then we start with the class proper. Okay, yes, thank you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you much. I thank you much. Jai Radha Madhava Punya Vihati Jai Radha Madhava Punya Vihati Jai Radha Madhava Punya Vihati Jai Radha Madhava
की जाए मुखम करोति पंगुम लंगयते गिरीं यत्तम वंदे श्री गुरु दिनता परमानंदमाताचैतन्यश्वर नम ओं विष्णुपदाय कृष्ण प्रेस्ताय भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदा स्वामी नमिने नमस्ते सरस्वतीदेव गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेषशुंजवादी पश्चतरिणे वंचकूप्या कृपा सिंधुप्या पतिता पावनेप्यो वैष्णवेप्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गाधर श्रीवासदी गौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण आई लाइक टू टू स्टार बाय थैंकिंग द ऑर्गेनाइजर्स ऑफ द स्कोर्स इफ आई अंडरस्टैंड करेक्टली आई I was invited through Rasala Prabhu, uh, and this course is arranged by the um, by the Iskon Temple in Rohini, New Delhi. Is that correct? Yes, Maharaj. Although, although I do I do see that the handbook is from the Mayapur Institute, the students' handbook. But they, yeah. I guess it, it is because the handbook is ready, so naturally we we use it. But the, the 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 examination center belongs to to Iskon Rohini, right? Yeah, yes, Maharaj. Um, Bimla Prashad Prabhu, you are coordinating programs, Bhakti Shasti programs. Yes, Maharaj. I am like coordinating uh, Bhakti Shasti programs for the last uh, seven years from Iskon Punjabi Bhag, and this is the first year Iskon Rohini has also registered. As as an uh, a nodal examination center, that's what it is. Okay. Okay. Good. So so I am honored to be in the first year of the of of Iskon Rohini as examination center. So it's for for me it's a pleasure and an honor to be here and to to, to be in the association of so many wonderful devotees from this important Iskon project. I know in New Delhi you have many temples, so I get you have so many temples, but I get lost. I hear. <laughs> <laughs> I know his holiness Gopal Krishna Goswami Maharaj uh, received instruction from Sri La Prabhupada to to open many centers in New Delhi. So, so I'm I'm happy to be of service to. To the, the devotees in Iskon Rohini, and if there are devotees from other places as we are online, also. Uh, yes, Maharaj. This is a festival. There are devotees from. There are devotees from England. There are devotees from Pakistan joining in this Maharaj. Okay, excellent, good. So thank you very much for being present for the first class of the Sri Shopanishad. This this session today will be mostly an overview and a look into the introduction of the Sri Shopanishad. I don't know how how are you with your reading, students? How how far you have gone? Did you do any reading? Maybe you you can have a show of hands. Those of you who can be virtual hands, if you prefer. Or or if I see you, you can also do it like this. So those of you who did the reading for the introduction recently, please uh, raise your hand. If you didn't, I understand you are busy people. Many of you are professionals, are working and maybe catching up, but some may, may be ahead and 
have done the reading. Okay, Gaurav Shaw Prabhu has done it, good. Anyone else have done it? Not yet, okay, it's fine. It's fine because we are starting today. Generally, I will recommend you do the reading and ideally the homework in your handbook for the section we'll be covering the next day. I do understand that you are busy people. Okay, Aradhya Kadadara Prabhu also seems to be have done it. The reading, good. So, so usually I will recommend that you do that. But I do understand you have families or studies or work. So if, if anyone has to catch up later on, that's fine. Like you can do at your own pace. The main thing is to, to study Srila Prabhupada's books and to, to, to go as deep as possible and to take up this wonderful opportunity you have. Uh, okay, there are more hands. Class Raman Krishna Prabhu also. When you are raising the hands, I understand you are saying you did the reading or you want to ask questions because no more hands are coming up. So Rukmini Hari Sevini Mataji also. If, if you want to ask questions, please unmute yourself and, and ask. Hi, Krishna Maharaj. Please set my respectful obeisances. It's for reading, Maharaj. I raise my hand. You ask so. Okay. So, so for reading. Okay, good. Good. Okay, so more devotees. Maybe you were a bit shy in the beginning to... But my, my presentation style uh, can be, can be uh, twofold. Sometimes can be interactive or can be quite traditional. I'm not sure what what are you accustomed to, but anyway, I'll I'll do my style, and then if something is, uh, you you are welcome to comment if something it, it makes it difficult for you, you are welcome to give feedback on the chat, or or you can also whatever opportunity we have, could contribute and 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 suggest what will be better for, for your studies. My role is to, to facilitate your studies and to, to support you on this section of the Bhakti Shasti course. Okay, good. So let's go into the overview. Okay, so this is our humble presentation of His Divine Grace Srila Prabhupada's presentation of Sri Ishopanisha. And we are scheduled to have classes for the next eight days, this week from Monday to Friday. So this will be five lessons, and next week from Monday through Wednesday. So today we will be looking to a general overview and introduction to Shri Shopanishad. Tomorrow, invocation. On Wednesday, mantras one through three on the Ishavasya principle, which actually gives name to the, to the Upanishad, Isha Upanishad. Uh, so some, some, sometimes some scholars call it Ishavasya Upanishad. This Isha Upanishad is the general name given. With the Sandhi, the unity of the two words Isha and Upanishad becomes Isha Upanishad. So that's on the third day, on Wednesday. On Thursday, uh, mantras four and five describing the inconceivable nature of the war. On Friday, mantra six through eight, describing the qualities of the Mahabhagavata, 
the most advanced devotee transcendentalist who knows the Lord and how he or she knows the Lord. On next week on Monday, mantras nine through 11, uh, comparing knowledge and ignorance. Actually, uh, mantras nine through 14, compare the absolute vision and, and the relative vision. So, so mantras nine through 11, describe what's true knowledge, vidya, and what's avidya, ignorance or uh, so-called knowledge, which is a worse form of ignorance. And then mantras 12 through 14, continuing on the analysis of the absolute and the relative, compares the worship of the supreme person, the absolute, the supreme truth, and the worship of uh, the, the demigods and the, the incomplete uh, understanding of the absolute and presenting it as the, the, the full realization, which is also considered uh, worse than, than worshiping material things directly. On the last day on Wednesday next week, we will discuss the last four verses, which are uh, changes in the in the style of the of the text. It moves to a to a more prayerful um, expression, in which the devotee uh, asks the Lord for revelation of his transcendental form and for the elimination of obstacles on the path of going back home, back to Godhead. And it's basically, we cover the, the contents of the Sri Shopanishad can be divided in, this, in these ways. Importance of Vedic knowledge in the introduction and then Invocation through mantra three, this could be described as Sambanda, Sambanda Jnana, the knowledge of the relationship between God, the living beings, and the phenomenal world. Mantras four to eight, uh, the inconceivable Lord, and how only the Mahabhagavat can truly understand him. And then, as we said, uh, 9 through 11, cultivation of knowledge versus cultivation of ignorance. And 12 to 14, worship of the absolute versus worship of the relative. And the last verses, prayers for the revelation of the spiritual form of God. Okay, before we move further, Let's check. Actually, I'm realizing you couldn't see my screen. Could, could you see what I was projecting? No. No, Maharaj. Oh, sorry about that. Because it was a song. So let me go back. So I'll show no this visually. So. No, you should be able to see. Yes, Maharaj, thank you. Okay, this is what we presented. These are the eight lessons I have described, so you can see more visually. This is the contents, which I was also repeating to kind of consolidate, but we were stating. Any questions on the general overview like this, like just the, how we're going to study and the 
the uh, broad overview of the issue of Anisha. Today we have the intention of reading all the verses and translations together after the introduction. So we see the flow of the text, but this will be towards the end of the class. Okay, so any, no questions on that. Okay, so we move, move forward. So uh, in Vedantic traditional studies, as some of you, or I, I'm not sure how many of you, how familiar you are, but I'll explain a little bit. Uh, according to the, to, to the Vedic literature, there are six classical schools of philosophy, Vedic philosophy, which are divided into, in, into three pairs. Sometimes they are called sisters philosophy. And Vedanta is one of them. It's actually one of, the, we, we can say it's a conclusive philosophy of the Vedas. Actually, the term Vedanta it implies Veda knowledge and Anta the, the, the wall ultimate goal of Veda. Vedanta means the philosophy which explains the final goal of Vedic study. Uh, for preaching, and especially you are in, most of you are in India, or are from Indian background. So of course, for, for those of us who are born in the West, like it's my case, and who are preachers, also, it is very relevant to, to, to have some, uh, to be familiar with, with how Vedanta is, is presented and how it is studied traditionally in India. Actually, the, 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 the classical study of Vedanta in the last, uh, say, uh, 13, 14 centuries since the birth of uh, Sri Shankaracharya, the proponder of Advaita Vedanta, or from which Mayavada my philosophy arises. In, of course, you may, you may have heard that Shankaracharya is an incarnation of Lord Shiva, we find in Chaitanya Charitamrita in chapter, if I remember correctly, in chapter six of Madhya Lila, in the conversations of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu with Sarva Bauma Bhattacharya, who was a, a staunch follower of the Shankaracharya Mayavada presentation, and who became a Vaishnava by the mercy of Sri. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, we find there are two verses in, in the Puranas, at least, they are quoted there in Chaitanya Charitamrita, which explain how the Lord gave the order to Lord Shiva to, uh, to preach Advaita Vedanta philosophy, to preach monism. The reason why uh, Shankaracharya is generally known as the first, although technically he is not the first, there are some, some other acharyas who, who uh, appear on earth before him. Like for, for example, in the Vaishnava line, we have Vishnu Swami Acharya, the, the, the leading uh, acharya of, of the uh, Rudra Sampradaya, one of the four Vaishnava Sampradayas. I don't want to digress too much, but I'm, I'm explaining this. If there are some terms which, which you, you perceive as, as being too much for your study of Ishopanishad, don't worry. It's not that 
all these these details may appear in your assessment. That's not the case. But for those of you who who have more more knowledge and experience, you may be happy to to go a little bit deeper into that. And as we were saying, as preachers, it may be relevant for for your preaching. So, so after, as you know, Shankaracharya established. Uh, actually, he re established the Vedic tradition in India, and he is credited for for pushing away or 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 stopping the propagation of. Anastika philosophies, or what we can we can say, non, non, non Vedic philosophies such as Buddhism and Jainism. Uh, sometimes, uh, like in the in a modern context, um, Shankaracharya is is recognized as one of the fathers of Hinduism. Mm. Of course, we know that Hindu is a modern term, like Prabhupada explains in the introduction of Sri Upanishad. The original term is Parna Ashrama, or we can say the tradition of the Veda. So uh, after Shankaracharya, many um, Vedanta, Vaishnava Vedanta Acharyas appear such as Madhvacharya and, and uh, Sri Ramanuja Acharya and like, like this, Sri Baladeva Vidyabhushana in our line and others. And they refuted uh, the, the propositions of Shankaracharya, which contradict the essence of the, of the Vedas which actually uh, the, the essence of the Vedas is found in these three main sources. What we call here three main sources of Vedantic knowledge. And these are the Vedanta Sutra. The Vedanta Sutra, as many of you will know, explains the essence of the Vedas in, in, uh, in the form of expressed in aphorisms. The, the term sutra literally means thread. It refers to the fact of having a thread. Because somebody needs to mute the mic. Okay. Yes, if you have questions, please raise your hand and I'll give you if you entrance if you have questions. So so, so we were explaining the meaning of uh, Vedanta Sutra. We, at the moment what we are doing, we are contextualized, contextualizing the Sri Ishopanishad in terms of as a source for Vedantic knowledge, knowledge of Vedanta, which may explain why Srila Prabhupada chose to translate and comment on the Sri Ishopanishad, or at least may give an explanation for that. So um, the, the term sutra, referring to the text known as Vedanta Sutra, literally means thread. And it, it can be compared like the, the, the thread of a cloth, like if you have a pullover, and you can actually pull, pull the thread, and you could actually undo the pullover, isn't it? If it's, Wool, you will you could pull and, and make it 
and yes, and do it. So uh, the idea of the sutras is that the truth is, ex is expressed in, in a minimal amount of words. Like for example, Srila Prabhupada frequently quotes the first sutra of the Vedanta Sutra, Atato Brahma Ignasa, which means here and now is the time to investigate, to research on Brahman, on the Absolute. And then the second sutra, Janmadi Yataha, answers the question of who is the Absolute Truth. He is a source of, of, of the origin of, of every, everyone and everything. He is a sustainer and he is who remains after the annihilation. And like that. Rukmini Harisevini Mataji, do you have a question or, or something you'd like to discuss? Maharaj just wanted to ask you that uh, uh, I'm not able to see the screen. So are you still showing the screen or we are not able to see or you are not showing? No, I what I did, thank you for asking. I, I took it out. Sometimes I will I will keep the screen. Sometimes I will I will go back and forth. Uh, so sometimes I go back so I see I show you, although many many of you don't have the cameras, but it's okay. But I, if you if if you if you wish, uh, okay. Uh, Radhagora Priyamata is asking if we can ability to okay this. Yeah, so you can read and follow what I'm explaining. That's good. Although I didn't say at the school because. <laughs> I had I didn't know that system is that is the first time I see this transcriptions on Zoom. So, anyway, so thank you so much, Maras, for it, uh, it may be that the transcription is not accurate because my pronunciation may may, may be like influenced by a Spanish accent. I hope you are able to follow me. Are you able to follow mostly? Yes, Maharaj, we're able to follow you. Yes, Maharaj. So anyway, but, but the translation written will be there and there may be something that is not accurate. So keep it in mind. So, Going back to the sources of, of Vedantic discourse, which you may be, may be used for preaching. So, and when, we, and when we say sources of Vedantic discourse, this implies that the commentators of the traditional schools of Vedanta study have written commentaries on these three texts or group of texts. Uh, like both impersonalists like Shankaracharya and, and others and Vaishnava Acharya such as Sri Madhva Acharya, Sri Ramanuja Acharya, Sri Lavaladeva Vidyavushan and so on. So there are the Vedanta Sutta, then we have the Upanishads. The Upanishads uh, are included in, in the original four Vedas, Rig, Sama, Yajur, and Atarva. Soon we, we will see, you have it also, your student's handbook, a chart, uh, contextualizing the, the, Shri, the, the Shri Shopanishad within the, the, the all, all the compound of uh, Vedic texts. Traditionally, there are 108 Upanishads. And this 
uh, Upanishads refer to the teachings the disciples will receive from the spiritual master when they will sit near to them. Upa means near, and Nishat refers to sitting, sitting next, sit, sitting close by. So, so Nishat sitting, Upa close by, close by, the disciple sits close by from the spiritual master and receives transcendental instruction. And from the 108 Upanishads, there are 10 who are considered most important because the Vedanta Charyas wrote commentaries on them. And the Sri Upanishad is one of these 10. So Ishopanishad is one of the most important Upanishads. And, and Bhagavad Gita also has been commented by uh, all types of Vedantic commentators, both Vaishnavas and impersonalists. And, and here you can see on the screen, uh, this is a, a, a chart that which was designed by, by one of the teachers, if I remember correctly, what this was done at the Vaishna Vrindavan Institute in, in, the, in the late 90s. And, and it has been adapted. It's, a, it's quite a comprehensive chart. I will not say it's, it's perfect, but it's the most comprehensive chart I have seen of how Vedic knowledge is divided traditionally. So we find, actually we, we find three divisions, but sometimes they are divided into two because the, one of them could be taken as a subdivision of the second of Smriti. So in the Vedas, we, we find Shruti and Smriti. Sh Shruti literally means that which is heard. Yes, it is correct as well, but it, but it means, but it is heard with the ear. So, the, the, the idea is that the original Vedas emanate from the breathing of Vishnu, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In his, in his um, Maha, uh, in his Purusha Vatara form, Maha Vishnu. And the, the four original Vedas, Rik, Yajur, Sama, and Atarva emanate from, from the breathing of the Lord. And the Vedas, in turn, are divided into four parts, which you can see when you look at the screen to the, as you look, uh, it is to the left, right? We have the some hitas, the mantras. Then we have the ritual explanation of the mantras called brahmanas. Then the aranyakas or esoteric explanation of the mantras. And finally the Upanishads, which uh, teach the philosophy of, about the absolute, about the Brahman. Brahman refers to God, to the the greatest. Sometimes these four sections of the Vedas are divided into uh, the four 
the, 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 the four ashramas. Like the Samhitas were particularly used by the students, the brahmacharis. The children will sing the Vedic mantas and will memorize them. You may remember that originally the Vedic knowledge was not written. So they will learn it by heart, by, by singing the mantras. Uh, the Brahmanas, the ritual explanation of such mantras will belong primarily to Grihastas. The Aranyakas, esoteric explanation will be for the Vanaprastas. And the Upanishads will be for the Sanyasis. Although, of course, the, all the Vedic knowledge is meant for all the members of human society. So it is not that you know, the Upanishads are meant only for sannyasis. Any, any preacher who wants to go deep into the presentation of Krishna consciousness may do well in be familiar with the message of the Upanishads and especially preaching in India you may find many people influenced by uh, monistic philosophy. So it's important to, to, to be familiar with the, the, the arguments found in the Upanishads. Generally speaking, the impersonalists prefer the Vedanta Sutra and the Upanishads because the presentation of Vedanta philosophy is more abstract. So they can defend better their impersonal approach to the understanding of the absolute truth. Whereas for devotees, the Bhagavad Gita is preferred because the message is very clearly devotional and theistic. So the, anyway, this is this is to contextualize the Sri Upanishad. It is one of the of the most important Upanishads and it is also very good to refute Mayavada philosophy because the followers of, of Shruti, generally many personalists follow uh, Shruti primarily, they don't like so much Smriti. Smriti is the part of the Vedas which uh, follows Shruti. The term Smriti means that which is remembered. So the, the, the Puranas, the Pancharatras, Itihasas, such as the, the Mahabharata and, and Ramayana, Harivamsha, and other, other Vedic texts, Tantras and so on, are considered Smriti, which basically means what the Acharyas of the Vedic tradition has explained about the original Vedas. Something to consider, nevertheless, is that uh, in the age of Kali, Smriti is considered more important than Shruti. For example, in the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam in chapter four, it is explained that the, the, the Puranas and the Mahabharata are considered the fifth Veda. And they are accepted by, by serious followers of the tradition of the Vedas. But the Many followers of Shankaracharya 
they will not accept Smriti as a prominent source of Vedic knowledge. They will prefer Shruti. Actually, they will they will say no Puranas this comes later, and it's it may be very much corrupted, so we don't take it seriously. And therefore, in order to preach to them, to quote these three sources, Vedanta Sutra, Upanishads, and Bhagavad Gita, may be effective and, and more impressive to them. And therefore, we, we see that Srila Prabhupada, in his purpose, will quote many times these uh, Shastras. And you can see, if you look at the section of Smriti, if you go down, I think it's written down because uh, for, for a space uh, purposes, but you will see the six, uh, six, six Saddarshanas or six philosophical perspectives or approach deriving from the Vedas. So you have Nyaya and Vaisheshika about epistemology, logic and metaphysics. Then, then we have Sankhya and Yoga establishing the spiritual principle and the material principle, Purusha and Prakriti, respectively. And then Karma Mimamsa and Vedanta, which is also known as Uttara Mimamsa. Mimamsa means deliberation. So Karma Mimamsa, the philosophy of very much connected to Karma Kanda, uh, a karma kind of approach to, to Vedic study, focusing on Dharma, Art and Kama, the first three Purusharthas, religiosity, economic development, and sense enjoyment. And the, so Karma Mimamsa is known also as uh, Purva Mimamsa, which means First deliberation about the truth, about the Veda. And Vedanta is known as Uttara Mimamsa, which indicates final deliberation and, and aims towards the fourth Purusharta, call of human endeavor, known as Moksha, liberation or Mukti. Uh, okay, if anyone would like, please to unmute yourself and you can read, this is a, a purport from Srila Prabhupada in Adilila Chaitanya Charitamrita, chapter seven. Anyone, please, yes. Can you read? According to learned scholars, there are three different sources of knowledge, which are called prasthanatraya. According to these scholars, Vedanta is one of such sources, for it presents Vedic knowledge on the basis of logic and sound arguments. In the Bhagavad Gita 13.5, the Lord says, Brahma Sutra Padais Chaiva Hetu Madhir Vinas Chitaha. Understanding of, of the ultimate goal of life is ascertained in the Brahma Sutra by leg, legitimate logic and argument concerning cause and effect. Therefore, the Vedanta Sutra is known as Nyaya Prasthana. The Upanishads are known as Shruti Prasthana, and the Gita, Mahabharata, and Puranas are known as Smriti Prasthana. All scientific knowledge of transcendence must be supported by Shruti, Smriti, and a sound logical basis. Chaitanya Charita Amrita Adi Lila 7108 Purpose. 
Thank you very much. So, okay, so, so here we see some more detail in, in the chart, Nyaya Prastana was not mentioned. It was included in Smriti, but technically, usually, as Srila Prabhupada explains here, it is divided into three, Shruti, Smriti, and Nyaya. So be before we continue further, any uh, questions or, or anything that needs clari clarification or further explanation from what we have presented so far? I, um, hope it yeah. was, I hope it was relevant to contextualize the issue of Upanishad within the Vedic canon texts. Yes, Aradhya Kadadara Prabhu. You have to acti activate your mic. Oh, I, I beg your pardon, Mara. sorry. Yeah, uh, much like in, it's regarding the six versions that we hear more of that. And it is more famous, you know, all across India, especially. So why all the six are not considered, I mean, uh, bona fide? I mean, in terms of perfect realization, especially in Iskon, we always hear in proper small books or even in big books, small big books, that uh, these are not ultimate goals, these six questions. I mean, of course, I know the meaning, but uh, many times I see the, the, the speaker, like there is uh, Gautam Rishi, one of the speakers, and there is Jamini Rishi, one of the speakers. So when I see the name of these Rishis, you know, Jamini, like you all know, is the disciple of um, uh, Vyat, uh, Vyas Devon and Gautam Rishi, we all know, is very famous. So, yeah, in this regard, if you could explain it. Yes. Well, regarding the Satashanas, we find different statements by Srila Prabhupada in his purpose. For example, in, in a commentary to the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam in the beginning chapters, I forgot if it is first or second chapter. It is one of the first two chapters. Srila Prabhupada writes that in order to sit on the Vyasa sun, one should become conversant with the six, the Sadarshanas, and should be able to present the message of Srimad Bhagavatam in a way which will be relevant to the philosophers of the different schools of philosophy. So, so actually each, each of the philosophical systems has its place within the, the Vedic tradition and that's why it is there, but, but also because the emphasis has been given more to, to moksha than to bhakti, in many of them, and in, and in many occasions, God has been relegated to, to the back, even, even if God is acknowledged, it is, he, he is not given the primal importance that, that he deserves. Therefore, sometimes Srila Prabhupada declares these philosophical systems as atheistic, but, but actually originally, all of them are theistic. Even Sankhya, the, the Sankhya philosophy is presented as atheistic, but actually the, the Kapila who, who proponed the, the atheistic system of philosophy is, is defined many times by Srila Prabhupada and other Vaishnava Acharyas as an impostor. The original Kapiladev is, is the, an incarnation of Krishna and we see his teachings, we can learn about them in the third canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. And they are highly theistic, much more than even the Bhagavad Gita. In Bhagavad Gita we find also the 24 elements of, of Sankhya 
classical philosophy. But in Srimad Bhagavatam, Lord Kapiladev explains it even in more detail. I hope this answers your question. Cannot hear. Uh, right. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, I mean, this also is most of the things, but uh, like if it talks specifically the karma vimamsha, this more or less only talking about how karma is the highest thing, and if you perform any karma, then you are bound to get the results for the same. So, how do we understand it having any relationship with God or Krishna? You mean the six philosophical systems? Yeah, yeah, for no, example. No, the, karma, the karma mimamsha specifically, where in karma mimamsha, karma is regarded as the highest thing, and whatever your karma you do, you will get your result as a consequence of that. So, there is no mention of God, especially by that, by Gemini Rishi. Mm -hmm. Yes, karma mimamsa may be useful for beginners on the path of the Vedic tradition. So they, they may become accustomed like dharma, artha, karma. It's like the beginning. At least they follow dharma, even if it is mundane, it is, if it is worship of demigods and so on. But the person is beginning his path. Uh, and then at some point when the person matures, may have access by sadhu sangha, by good association, may have access to Vedanta philosophy, which actually traditionally is called like that. Purva Mimamsha is Karma Mimamsha and Uttara Mimamsha is Vedanta. So there is an, an, a natural connection for ordinary people. Of course, for devotees, they will not waste time into the, the focus of karma mimamsa. Like Krishna explains in chapter two of the Bhagavad Gita. By the way, so, so far, how many books of the Bhakti Shasti have you studied? Is this your last book, your first book, how far you are? Did you do Gita? Uh, once we have done Gita, first to 12th chapter, the last unit, which is uh, studying the 18th chapter, is remaining. Also, we have covered NOD. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's good to know. So, so in, in the second chapter of the Gita, which you have studied, the, there is mention of the flowery language of the Vedas. And Krishna re rejects it. Taigunya Vishaya Veda is Taigunyo Bhavarjuna. Nirduando Mohachat Vasto. Nir Yoga Kshema Atmavan. This Zoom doesn't speak Sanskrit. Cannot understand anything. <laughs> so, so, so in that verse, Krishna tells Arjuna that the Vedas deal with the three modes of material nature, Arjuna go beyond these modes and become transcendental, go beyond the duality of the material world. So, so, so that's the idea that, that when we go deeper into Vedanta, Karma Mimamsa is rejected as inferior. And actually, in the Vedanta Sutras, Srila Vyasadev has refuted all the other philosophical systems. So, we, and therefore, it, 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 his presentation of, of the Ve philosophy of the Veda is called Vedanta, the final conclusion. But, but we do use principles of all the philosophies in order to preach Krishna consciousness, they can be used. For example, there is so much on yoga in Bhagavad Gita, in Srimad Bhagavatam, also Sankhya, the principles of Purusha and Prakriti. So, so like that, the, the, especially Sankhya, yoga, 
and Vedanta are very much used for preaching Krishna consciousness. Of course, we present it in, in a, a devotional, clear approach, which is different from what other yoga schools may, may present. Gaurav Prabhu, you had... Uh, 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 sorry, uh, actually, so, so regarding if we take the example of Karma Nuvamsa and we take the example of Jamini Muni giving this philosophy, who is an, who is an disciple of Yasudev. So when he gave this philosophy, his purpose was this, so that using this philosophy, people can eventually come to Krishna consciousness. Or this was his conclusion that he thought that Karma Mimamsa is the highest thing. What was his purpose for him? Well, that, that's not stated in Srimad Bhagavatam. In chapter four of the Bhagavatam, it is explained how Srila Vyasadev, who is the author, and he had the intention to elevate gradually humanity. And, and he gave each of the Vedas to a particular disciple who, who was like kind of the, the a presenter of, of the expert on that particular Veda. I, I will assume that originally they knew what was the purpose because Shirla Vyasadev knew, but also we may remember that, that afterwards Srila Narada Muni uh, chastised Srila Vyasadev for having digressed so much from the straightforward conclusion of the Vedas, which is pure devotional service. So, so, the, so they may have known due to the association of Srila Vyasave, but as many of the followers of the Vedas nowadays forget the original purpose and need to be reminded and need to be educated about it. So it may be the case that some of the immediate disciples of Srila Vyasadev may, may have become too absorbed in their particular perspective and miss the point. That's not explained specifically that I remember. I don't remember having found any purpose of Srila Prabhupada addressing precisely that particular question. But this is what I can comment on it. Okay, Maharaj. And, and one last question, Maharaj. Like out of the six darshanas, uh, if you see Vedanta, Vimamsa, Yoga, and Sankar, these four, you know, we are more prevalent and we do hear about them more often than not. But specifically the Nyaya and the Vaisheshika philosophy, can you just, you know, give some brief about what is this about? Because we have never heard, at least I have never heard this. Yes. Nyaya deals more with, uh, with logic and epistemology based on the Vedas, and it's a lot about argument. Uh, and Vaisheshika is quite similar to Nyaya, that's why they're called sister philosophies. And they also analyze nature, I mean, the, the reality in different categories. If I remember correct, correctly, they call it padartas, different divisions of creation. Uh, Vaisheshika focuses on or metaphysics and particularly on the principle of singularity. That's why it's called Vaisheshika, like Vishesha. Vishesha indicates uh, singu singularity or, or particular qualities of, of nature and so on. So, so these are more distant, we can say, from, from the devotional philosophy but also both accept the existence of God. The difference with Vedanta is that they do not give emphasis to God. And as we were mentioning before, that's why Srila Prabhupada many times refers to them as atheistic philosophies. E even the Sankhya philosophy of the atheist Kapila 
If we look at the main text of their tradition, it's called Sankhya Karikas by one fellow named Ishvara Krishna, which is ironic because the name is, is devotional. I mean, Ishvara Krishna, highly tasty. But in the text, Dorsen speak about God. So it's 70 verses. So, but, but, but actually, the text doesn't deny God either. So we say it is atheistic, but it doesn't say God does not exist. It just focuses on, on Purusha and Prakriti without speaking about God. So um, uh, what I would tell is that Nishya Sita is also like Sankhya, you know, it's analyzing nature, but in a specific, in its own specific manner. And uh, uh, am I right, Maharaj, regarding Nishya Sita? Yes. Yes. And the Naya, you said it's about argument and logic. So it basically means that, uh, you know, general populace, if they are caught up in, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, doubt or some kind of, you know, doubt or something like that. So it presents various arguments and uh, to justify that which thing is better than this and this thing is better than this, this thing is better than this. Is it like this? Yes, yes. It's, it's a systematic process of, of arguing uh, thesis and thesis. That's, the Vedanta Sutta actually is called Nyaya Prastana because it follows the, uh, the, the, the Nyaya approach to understanding the truth not because it is it it, it is um, it focuses on on the philosophical analysis of the followers of the nyaya school but the, but it uses the methodology of nyaya which is traditional in vedic debate okay uh, i'm pretty much clear now thank you Okay, Gaurav Prabhu. Uh, Hare Krishna. Uh, Let's thank you for the podcast from the, uh, from the answers that you're asking for. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I, I couldn't understand, sorry. I got the answer to my question from the answers that you asked for. It's a bit blurry. Maybe, maybe it's a, since it is short, what you're saying. If you can write it on the chat, please, and I'll be able to follow better. Maharaj, can I say what Prabhuji is saying? Yes. Uh, Maharaj, Prabhuji is saying that by answering your co by answering questions of his guest, uh, Radhe Gadadar Prabhu, Gaurav Shah Prabhu has already got the answers. He's okay. saying this. Okay, thank you. Very clear. Thank you. Okay, so let's, I think now will be a natural time to take a five minute break, five, six minutes break. So it is up to, it must be now there. Just one second, I'll check the time here. So in, your, in India, it is 13, right? It is 13 past, so it will be, uh, we can come back at 19 pass in India time. Okay, Hare Krishna.
Hare Krishna, we are coming back. So in this second part of today's class, we will focus on the introduction of the Sri Shopanishad which is a transcription of a lecture given by Srila Prabhupada in Conway Hall in London in 1969. It, it, it is a lecture about uh, what are the Vedas? And basically it establishes what we could call Vedic epistemology. Epistemology deals with, it's a, we can say it is a branch of philosophy which deals with the theory of knowledge. In other words, what is a reliable source to present knowledge? These are called pramanas. Pramana means evidence. So we will look a little bit into that. The Vedic epistemology as presented by Srila Prabhupada in this uh, in this lecture, which has been published as an introduction of the Sri Ishopanishad. And this is what we find in the introduction. First, we find a broad definition of the term Veda as knowledge, and particularly Srila Prabhupada says that Veda refers to the original knowledge. Then Srila Prabhupada establishes that in order to obtain perfect or complete complete knowledge, one must learn it from the Vedas. In order to explain why this is so, he presents the four defects of embodied beings or conditioned souls. And also in relation to that, he presents the three main pramanas or source of knowledge accepted in Vedic tradition, from, from which accepting, accepting the authority, learning from the authority, and especially for transcendental matters, learning from the Vedas is uh, unavoidable, is compulsory. Otherwise we, we have many, many possibilities of failing in, in, in acquiring transcendental knowledge. Then Srila Prabhupada gives a brief summary of Vedic literature, which we have given already in the, in the first part of today's class. Srila Prabhupada didn't use the chart, but the same principles of compilation of the Vedas are very briefly mentioned throughout the lecture. And Srila Prabhupada particularly underlines that Krishna is the highest authority 
of Vedic knowledge. And he's the ultimate goal of the Vedas. As we find in chapter 15 of the Bhagavad Gita, Vedaisya Sarvai Ahameva Vidya, that through the Vedas, I am to be known. So, so this is basically the main points which Srila Prabhupada presents in, in, in the lecture, of course, with, with many details. I know we will go through them and we can have discussions as much as we need. In the beginning of the lecture, Srila Prabhupada made this statement. So if anyone please likes to read what's on the screen. What constitutes a relevant understanding of the following statement made by Srila Prabhupada? What are the Vedas? The Sanskrit verbal root of Veda can be interrupted variously, but the purport is finally one. Veda means knowledge. Any knowledge you accept is Veda. For the teachings of the Vedas are the original knowledge. In the conditioned state, our knowledge is subjected to many deficiencies. Thank you. So, how do we understand, how do we understand this statement? Like it seems to be, like Srila Prabhupada says that the, the Veda means knowledge. Okay, that's clear. But to say any knowledge you accept is Veda. Well, how do we understand this? And like our knowledge is suggest, subjected to many deficiencies in the conditioned state, but then it, Prabhupada states, any knowledge you accept is a Veda. How would you explain this to a person, say a new person to Krishna consciousness who will read the introduction of the Sri Shopanishad and will ask you, what will you say? Maharaj, can I? Yes. Uh, Maharaj, um, there uh, as we, uh, in the beginning, just two minutes ago, we were talking about the four defects of embodied beings. We have four defects, like uh, we we commit mistake. If if I just take the one first defect, if I commit mistake, so if I'm committing mistake, then how can I do something which can be universal, and uh, which is universal? It should not be of any defect. It means which it should not have any mistake. If I have a tendency to commit mistake, so I cannot uh, move. Um, make a rule or make a um, principle or something like which would be before the everyone. First thing is this. Second is uh, another defect. If I take it's to be illusion. Illusion means something uh, uh, which I'm accepting, which is actually not. So, uh, and third is a cheating propensity. If I'm having the cheating propensity, how can if it means that I'm not pure and to be established something pure. So uh, um, that uh, that should be uh, uh, very authentic. But if I'm having the cheating propensity, how can, uh, if I present something that can be very authentic, it's not at all. And um, uh, lastly, my uh, our senses are not imperfect. So uh, I cannot see behind the wall like this. If I, uh, and Vedas are, um, Vedas uh, are like if it if I talk about the Vedvyas, uh, Shila Vedvyas. So he is a literally incarnation of Krishna. Whatever Krishna, uh, like if we talk about the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna, whatever I have spoken, we accept it. And uh, Vedas, literally incarnation of Krishna, with what he has given, yes, we accept it because he is incarnation of Krishna. He is not an uh, like a normal being like me. So I'm of these, I'm full of these four defects, but he's not. So I will, and every intelligent person will gonna prefer that, which is uh, with, uh, from a person who is above all these four defects. 
which is Ved Vyas, Shila Ved Vyas is. Okay, well, what, what you stated is correct. Still, the, the, the question, yes, it's very good explanation of the four defects and why we should accept the Vedas. But Srila Prabhupada has written that any knowledge we accept is Veda. And so how that how come this any knowledge we accept is Veda? Gaurav Prabhu, you want to, to respond? Uh, yes, Maharaj. Am I audible now, Maharaj? Yes. Uh, thank you. So Maharaj, I just want to ask here, Prabhupada is telling that any knowledge you accept is Vedas. So I I think maybe Prabhupada is what Prabhupada wants to, us to say, like we should accept only those knowledge that are from Vedas. Means it is not key, any random knowledge that is coming out that is uh, that is that we should accept. Or in other words, or in another way, I am thinking like Vedas contain knowledge of all different branches, starting from scientific literature. Uh, astrology and so on and so forth. So Vedas cover all different branches of knowledge that exist to us. So in that manner, any knowledge we accept is actually Vedas. So these are the things that are okay. Okay, these two explanations are sensible and good. We we could add also that even say knowledge that is found in any university. If it is true knowledge of any aspect of this world, also can be found in the Vedas. Say, for example, in physics, the, the scientists speak about the atom, and the atom is mentioned in the Vedas as well. So, so we can take like Veda's knowledge in terms of the original tradition of knowledge coming from God through the generations of gurus to, to humanity. But also it may mean that even if humanity does research, if, if the, the researchers find reliable knowledge can be confirmed with the Vedas. So this will be another way of looking at it. Does that make sense? Uh, Maharaj, can you please repeat the last line? The last explanation that you wrote? Yes, I, I was saying, that the, the, the last line you mean if I can repeat. Yeah, Maras, the last uh, explanation that we gave. Yeah, it was frozen. The audio was frozen. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, I was saying that that the even if some type of knowledge has been achieved through research, say empirical research through science. For example, atom, scientists speak about atom, but also the philosophers of Paisheshika, they were speaking already about atom. And we find in the third canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, how the Paramanu, which is a term used to refer to, to, the, to the, the smallest material particle, it was already referred to in the Vedas. So knowledge can be achieved through Vedic tradition, but also some partial knowledge can be achieved through other means, but then we will be able to confirm it with the Vedas. And I was asking is, is if this makes any sense. Yes, clear? Uh, Maharaj, uh, not much to me. I think like you are telling the knowledge is already in Vedas. Just like the knowledge of atom is already in Vedas. 
but the details maybe be the principles of trash knowledge and traders but the details may be different because every day new and new theories are coming out by the uh, different branches of knowledge so not necessarily those things will be there in traders in that sense yes and the details may be different you are right but the principles are there like also we find we find in the vedas vaimanika shastra it is about aeronautics okay maybe the vimanas using the times of your by followers of what of vedic culture in previous ages they will have different vimanas and the modern airplanes but the principle of traveling through flying uh vehicles was there and it is there now so it is in that sense it is part of the veda of course ultimately the goal of the vedas is to to bring the souls who are in human bodies as quickly as possible back to godhead back to the spiritual world okay any further questions or comments on this otherwise we move uh, to the four types of defects rukmini hari seveni mataji explained them nicely but we will look at them a little bit closely on on the screen asnar <laughs> bolsi So these are the four types of defects um, mentioned by Srila Prabhupada, and these are uh, classical defects which are identified by philosophers who follow the Vedas. So the tendency to commit mistakes, tendency to be illusion, cheating propensity. in perfect senses in relation to tendencies to commit mistakes shila prabhupad mentions uh, some per personalities consider special people such as mahatma gandhi and president kennedy both were killed and it seems that they were warned uh, about it in the case of of gandhi ji uh, shrila prabhupad had um had personally warned him there is a letter which is published in in the compilation of shrila prabhupad's teachings on different topics in three volumes uh, many of you will be familiar with it Shikshamrita. Have you seen Srila Prabhupada Shikshamrita? So if you look at Srila Prabhupada's letters and you look at personalities, you can find a letter to Mahatma Gandhi. And Prabhupada wrote a very extensive letter inviting him to retire from politics. This was after uh, India had gotten independence. from british colonialism and shri prabhupad was well acquainted with the political situation in india so he wrote to gandhi and invited him to retire from politics and to join him and study and discuss together bhagavad gita and in, and specifically prabhupad told him that otherwise you may find a, an untimely death by your political um, associates so and this is what happened he didn't it seems that that gandhi didn't take it serious the the good advice was coming prabhupad was presenting himself as an unknown friend 
It's actually quite a long letter. I, I didn't post it here. You can research it if you like, if you want to read the whole thing. But I did post, I did got this from a lecture propagated in London, speaking about it to a certain extent. If anyone likes to read, this illustrates Gandhi's mistake of not listening. In our country, we have seen many politicians, 75 years old, 80 years old, not only in our country, in other countries also. In your country, Great Britain, Mr. Churchill, unless he was forced to death, he would not give up politics. Our Gandhi, he was killed by another political group. He was forced to retire. When Gandhi attained independence, I requested, requested him in a letter Mahatma Gandhi, now you have started. Now you have started your struggle with the Britishers, uh, that they should go and Indians should have their independence. Now you have attained independence and Britishers have gone. Now you preach Bhagavad Gita. You have got some influence. You are known throughout the whole world a very saintly person. And you also pose yourself that you are a great scholar of Bhagavad Gita. Why don't you take a Bhagavad Gita and preach? There was no reply. And he was still meddling with politics. So much so that his own assistants became disgusted. And this, and it is said that he was planned to be killed. Just see how much intoxication of this materialistic way of life. He was considered a Mahatma, a great personality, and he got this. So Raj, the Britishers left India. Still, he would not give up politics. Still, he would stick unless he was forced to give up. He was killed. Similarly, Jawaharlal Nehru also. Nobody would retire voluntary unless he is killed by somebody or he is killed by the laws of material nature. This is disease. He cannot give it up. Sheila Paupa's lecture in London, 12th of September, 1969. Thank you. So that's a very clear example of committing mistakes. Even a, a, an important personality receives a good advice, but sometimes will not take seriously the advice. Yes, there is a question. Aratya Gadadara Prabhu. Yes, Mahat. So, uh, like when you were giving the example of verifying the scientific discoveries with the, what is given in the Vedas, you are also referring to Adam, which is being referred as the Mangan. So, in this regard, I wanted to ask that, uh, like in uh, um, the modern science, there is called, there are also debates about the division of atom into nucleus, proton, electron, and everything. And there is no reference to that in the Vedas. So, as a spiritualist, should we accept this thing? This, you know, division of atoms. I mean, uh, at least in our devotee circle, uh, talking in terms of outside world and world, but in devotee circle, should we accept this? I mean, we do not necessarily accept. Do you mean specifically the dating of the Vedas? or their interpretation in general? No, I'm referring to this particular example of atomic atomic division. There is no reference to them in uh, Vedas. In Vedas, atom is a you know, indivisible thing. I and mean, the last thing that we, we can hear of, we don't hear anything like nucleus or, or protons or nucleus or electrons, which are there in the atom, which is not in, in the Vedas. So I'm asking that in the devotee circle, should we accept this division of atom into nucleus, proton, electrons, and other things, or we should not accept this one? Yeah, I mean, if we see that the, the modern version matches the version of the Vedas, then we take it okay, it's matching, it's a confirmation. If we see that there is discrepancy, then we take it that the modern version may not yet be sufficiently refined because we have practical experience that modern science has been changing. So whatever 
something that was accepted in the 70s now is considered obsolete or they have developed much more. So that's something to, to keep in mind that whatever is learned through the senses may become more, more understood later on and, and properly understood. For instance, if we look at physics, uh, nowadays, nowadays uh, some scientists are discussing quantum physics, which is a much more sophisticated approach to understanding the nature of the physical world. And it is much more consistent with the Vedic explanation, which is a highly esoterical. So that's something to keep in mind. So, so we don't have a problem to, 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 to take, to look at the two. And if there are discrepancies also, maybe explain with some other part of the Vedic teachings as well. Sometimes we find an explanation, but then later on we find other arguments or, or other shastras which elaborate more on a particular topic. Something to keep in mind is that according to Srila Jiva Goswami, the, the amount of original text from the Vedas we have available at the moment equals only 20% or so. So, of course, we, we do have Srimad Bhagavatam, which is enough to explain the absolute truth. But there may be more detailed explanation in other texts which are not available anymore. For example, in supplementary Vedic, Vedic sources, such as, um, or Vedic sciences, such as Ayurveda, science that studies medicine, uh, medicine and how to, to, to live a more healthy life. We don't find many written texts. A lot of it comes through, through oral tradition. There are a few written texts, but not many, which indicates that, that many elements may have been lost because the books were lost. And therefore we may be lacking certain, certain particular details or, or, or expanded information on specific topics given on, on those texts which were lo lost. Does this answer the question? Don't hear. Oh, I'm sorry. Am I audible now? Yes. Yeah. So, Maharaj, what I take from this is that, of course, as of now, whatever we have seen in the Veda, this atom is the you know fine, most minute thing. But like 80% of the Vedas are not available. So, the uh, division of atom and what is there inside the atom might also be available in those 80%, although we are not available for that as of now. I mean, so talking about this example, and in a general also, we can learn from this general that many things which are there in the Vedas become because of the absence or, or presence of those things. Yes, that will be an explanation. And also there may be some details which the Vedas have not revealed because it was not necessary. Some things may not be required for human beings. Like many, many of the commodities developed by modern science are harmful or useless. So therefore may not have not been included on the Vedas on purpose. What it and and Mara, just one more thing I wanted to ask that uh, I mean where are those original Vedic texts available? Those 20% that we refer to. Or those in the original form, are they available anywhere? 
Yeah, I mean, the tradition was that the books were copied by hand. So different books you have to, you can go to, to all texts and find in certain libraries, there are many manuscripts and, and so on. And usually uh, sign, scientists, what they do, they look into the ancient versions of the text, but sometimes of course, may have some of the copies may have been destroyed over time, and that's natural. Like even we look now at the books which are published in in the contemporary world, and even some books from less than one century century ago are difficult to find, and they were printed in by thousands of copies, but then you have to look for them to find them so so it should not surprise us that some texts may may have been i mean ancient edition of the text may have been lost the good news nevertheless is that they were copied and they were passed through the many generations usually empirical scientists look into a reliable process of research by looking into the antiquity of the text and the philological considerations and so on. The, we have in Kolkata, we have the Bhaktivedanta Research Center and they are preserving many manuscripts from centuries ago from the Kaudilya Vaishnava tradition. Yeah, Maharaj. So, Maharaj, uh, like, uh, I mean, uh, like the original, if you see the original Chitta Nishitamrit that was written by Krishna Dakshavarad, or the original Chitta Nemangal, or the original scriptures written by Vyasa himself, is there any of those things available, I mean, uh, as of now? There, there, are avail there are texts available written by hand by the Goswamis of Prindavan and the associates of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And also some have, the original copy may have been lost. That, because that's the law of time. I mean, it happens. It is like how many editions of the first Krishna book written, published by Srila Prabhupada in 1970 are there. We do have Krishna book, but it's are new editions. So if it's happening in the contemporary context, so naturally, if you go back, there are also some, some editions which were lost and some editions which luckily are there because they were carefully preserved by the, the devotees in different clothes and so on. But, but the Bhaktivedanta Research Center, what, is, what it's doing is digitalizing the old editions because sometimes these pergamins or old, old leaves where it was written are attacked by, by small bugs and, and start destroying it. So they are digitalizing all the, all the books. So that after 1000 years, if the world as it is now continues, which we'll see, we don't know, but we think that this technology will go on forever, but we don't know. Like they're talking about about atomic war and, and three world war, so we don't know what will happen. Krishna knows, but we don't know. So the, the point is that that the it can be preserved and it's good that we preserve whatever we have for future generations. And now we have all these uh, like new technologies so we can use it in Krishna service, but it's good to keep the two, not just the new technologies, but also preserve books and, and ensure that there is continuity in printed format, just in case. Thank you. Okay, let's continue with 
the next next defect. So I think the defect of committing mistakes seems to be clear, right? This is the second second defect. If anyone likes to read. Another defect, to be illusioned. Illusion means to accept something which is not, Maya. Maya means what is not. Everyone is accepting the body as the self. If I ask you what you are, you will say, I am Mr. John. I am a rich man. I am this, I am that. All of these are bodily identifications. All of these are bodily identifications. But you are not this body. This is illusion. Hare Krishna. Thank you. You know this fellow? This fellow, you know? Yes, my dad. In the picture. I, I don't know yes. him, but I figured out there must be a famous actor from Bollywood, right? Yes, my dad. <laughs> and he's educating people on becoming identified with the body. Like, like so it, it is illusion. It, of course, it, Bollywood may do also some, some books with some films which are, are consistent with, with very knowledge, but, the, but I think the majority of films made by Bollywood are identifying people into illusion. Of course, also in America, they have Hollywood and each each country has their own ways. And then there is the cheating tendency. Cheating tendency is very prominent. Sometimes uh, Srila Prabhupada will tell a story uh, taught by Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati Thakur, mm, which is how this world is a place of the cheaters and the cheated. There's a story of a king who was, uh, who had, uh, he, he got a, a, he had a, a, a precious object. Sometimes it is described as a jewel. Sometimes it is described as a very delicious, special fruit, whatever it was, a mango, special mango type. He got it. So uh, he gave it as a present to the queen. The queen had the mango and she gave it as a present. She had an affair, illicit affair with one secretary at the palace. So he gave the mango to the, the special mango to his lover. This this secretary of the palace had also, besides having an, an affair with the queen, had an affair with another female secretary at the palace. So he gave her as a present, a special mango. And that female secretary had an affair with the king and she gave the mango to the king. So when the, the mango came to the king, he was wondering how come this is the original, but this is what I gave, how it, it turned around and it came back. So this shows the cheating tendency and Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur will explain this to illustrate this tendency which is very much there in the material world. Even among intimate, intimate persons like in a conjugal relationship, unfortunately in Kali Yuga, this is going on. Of course, we are, we are against it and we recommend to be chased in marriage relationships and so on. But the cheating tendency is very strong in Kali Yuga. And then we have the imperfect senses. So 
So, so we cannot see without the glasses, we cannot see properly. Many of us like, for, I need reading glasses and for seeing short distance. Otherwise I, I will be like this lady looking like this. So in order to see the screen properly, I need the glasses. So if I cannot even see the screen, I have few centimeters distant from me properly without glasses, how I want to see God. People say, if God exists, show me God. But if we cannot see even our own eyelids, how we will see God? It is foolish to demand to see when we can see so little in this world. As Sri Prabhupada writes, when it gets dark, we cannot see. Even our own hands, when it is dark, we cannot see. We need the sunlight or artificial light. Any questions or comments in this regard? Is where this is in regard to the four defects. Okay, seems to be very clear. So the point is that when we have these four defects, our capacity to obtain complete knowledge is very much hampered. And therefore we need help. We cannot not do it by ourselves. And this will bring us to the next point. Srila Prabhupada explains, which is related to epistemology, Vedic epistemology, the three pramanas. Pramanas refers to the sources of knowledge. Prameya is the object of knowledge. So the ultimate object of knowledge is Krishna, is God. And Pramana, it is a reliable source to obtain knowledge. And although there is a long list of up to 10 different Pramanas or sources of knowledge, the three you have on the screen, which Srila Prabhupada describes in the introduction of Sri Shopanishad, are the main ones. There is Pratyaksha, referring to sense perception. So we acquire knowledge through sense perception, through seeing, tasting, for example, when, if I take a, a, um, a, a food stuff, I, I never have tasted. So I can learn if it is sweet or bitter, salty, and so on. So by pratyaksha, I can learn something about a particular object. And, and in modern science, this can be compared to what it is called empiricism. Modern science is very much based on empiric, uh, ex empiric experiences. So Pratyaksha implies perception of the senses. Of course, we could say since the senses are imperfect, therefore our perception may be subject to limitations. For instance, we have only certain frequency we're able to hear. There are some very, very, um, very high 
sounds, which uh, uh, some types of dogs are able to hear it. And sometimes it is used for, for security purposes that if some danger will be there, the, the guard or the, the, the master of the dog will blow a sound which the human ear will not be able to hear, but the guardian dog will be able to hear, and then the, the dog will come in. So these things are there, uh, and with all the all the sensors, there are varieties of ranges of perception. So this illustrates the limitations of empiric perception, pratyaksha, what it is called, direct perception in this world. Another source of knowledge is what it is called anumana, which basically indicates the process of investigation, formulating hypotheses. This process many times especially in, in modern times, uh, it is very much linked to the previous one. Induction and deduction with the mind and the intellect, we come to conclusions. For example, a classical example in philosophy it is used very much in logic that if we see a smoke, coming from a mountain, we conclude that it's fire in the mountain. But it is not always true that this is the case. Or we may not un understand whether the fire is controlled or uncontrolled. So there are limitations of what, what it is called in in modern uh, scientific terms, rationalism, to try to understand the truth through, through rational analysis. And then we have shapta, which basically means hearing from the authority. And this is actually the most reliable process for obtaining knowledge. And particularly Shapta refers to hearing from Vedic authority. But the same principle may, may apply in other contexts. The, the classical example given by Srila Prabhupada is how to understand the identity of the father when the child son, daughter, didn't have the chance to meet the father for whatever circumstances of life. Now it's becoming fashionable. I don't think in India that much, but unfortunately it's coming there as well. It's becoming fashionable. All these, what they call monoparental families. Do you have that in India? You don't have. You're lucky, but it is happening more and more in the West. And this madness will unfortunately come to India as well, unless the third, third World War comes before something happens and stops it. But it's, or, or we preach so strongly that, that we counteract it before it reaches India. You have to preach very strongly. So the, they have here what they call monoparental families, or also they have this LGTB. You have this in India? Yes, my lads. It's there as well, yeah. It's all over, it's globalized. LGTB, lesbian, gay, whatever, whatever else. And now they have plus and so on. So, so the madness is increasing. 
I don't mean to undermine anybody, like every soul, regardless of whatever karma the person has, is a part of God and is worth of respect. But I mean the, the systematic way of propagating um, in, improper understanding of things which are innate to you, is what I mean. And, and creating bewilderment among people, especially among the younger generations, also the older as well, because it's becoming very, very crazy the, what's going on in the world in terms of education. But, but the, the point is that if, if a person wants to know the identity of the father, the natural authority is the mother. Isn't it? Of course, somebody could argue, yeah, but nowadays you have this DNA test. So you can find out through empirical research who is the father. What would you answer if somebody will come up with this argument in your preaching? You are using the metaphor given by Srila Prabhupada in the introduction of the Shopanishad, and this fellow comes and tells you the argument I just mentioned. What would you answer? In this case, we can see we can uh, see that if a person don't know his father and now he has to go through all the world population and uh, of male population and then find out uh, who is the father actually. So it is a very cumbersome process. Like there was a, a devotee did the calculation. It took around so many hundred years or something like that uh, to if the uh, each DNA test uh, consists of so many minutes, then it will take so many hundreds and thousands of years to come to. Uh, be able to rectify his father from the whole world's population. So yeah, so it is not a very intelligent approach in a manner. Yes, good, very good point. Yes, so so in other words, the mother will have to point out who should be tested if we want to verify it with empirical research. Sometimes there are I don't know if it happens in India, here in the West, sometimes. Famous people like actors or people who are very wealthy, they have illicit children. And then when they get old, the, the grown up children who become adults because they want money from their father, they put a, a complaint in court and they say, such and such singer is my father. I want part of inheritance. It is legitimate for me because he's my, my legitimate father. I mean, even if it was irreligious, but biologically, he's my father, so I want, I want money for you. Does this happen in India sometimes? Yes, Some court cases? Yes, like yes, that. In political leaders, I have heard few cases like that. So, so, so like that, and, and the process, the, or the mother is the one who reveal who is the father. Otherwise, how the child can know where to put the complaint. Of course, some some people may invent something, but if they if it is just invented without any any uh, witness from the mother's side, it will become very difficult for them to win the court case. Gaurav Prabhu, you had. Your, your hand raised before, you, you may want to ask a question on this matter. Uh, yes, uh, Maharaj, I just want to ask the topic that he was discussing, like Shabd Praman. So we can understand like Shabd Praman is the most verified approach or the most authentic approach or reliable approach. It is all right. But also in case of Shabd Praman also, just like whenever a decision has to be made on any any topic, it is like any topic we see, like some decisions that we made. We see, like from Shabdraman or from Vedas only, there are some points, some parts which are supporting the fact. There are also some points 
that are against the fact in these things happens like any social issue or any anything like that. so isn't that also a deficiency of sub government that it can't give a direct solution or very clear cut uh, result of many many things not i am not talking of the basic things obviously basic philosophical things are in a way same but also there are many uh, things with which both sides are there so in these cases we generally see like whatever the authorities recommending whatever the gbc has decided we generally go with that so but but there is somewhat of i feel uh, not a very uh, clear cut solution to this I'm just trying to i think yeah yes ma'am yes i'm i'm not sure if i properly understood your question but i'll answer and then you tell me if, if there is something that needs to be clarified or or i didn't get from the question regarding like for example in the vedas there may be certain type of of information that details which may not be there like for example in patma purana there is a division of 8,400,000 species of life in the universe from which 400,000 are human which in my understanding from what you read this includes higher beings like demigods and, and like that so and details may not be given like a full list of all the 400,000 species of life but the details may not be given because are not necessary for the purpose of the Vedas. The purpose of the Vedas is to reveal Krishna. Veda is just Sarvaila Hameva Vedya, to reveal who is God and that we should surrender unto him. And therefore, no further detail is given. But then if further de detail is is wanted, okay, pratyaksha can be a way of going more into detail, although we should acknowledge that there will be also limitations there. Because how, how much, how far we can go in discovering varieties of species and naming them. We can do, but then there may be changes. We may not be so clear how to match this with the original affirmations of the Vedas. So, so the point is that whatever we find in the Vedas is there because it is useful for advancing human society to the goal of life. Whereas for other details, we may not need that this is directly explained unless uh, unless we could say tangentially may have been spoken. Like for example, if sweetness about a particular fruit is mentioned in the Vedas, but the focus is not to, to teach how all the fruits are sweet and this and that, but then we can taste by empiric perception, we can get the taste of the, of the fruits and have some, some material experience in that regard. So I don't know if this, this addresses your question. So uh, Maharaj, I was uh, just like, I am openly asking the question, like suppose uh, I'm, ta I'm talking about, suppose who can uh, be like, who can be uh, like, suppose get some spiritual position, like you know, there may be some in Vedas also, there are some evidences that are given that person should be some places in the scriptures it is mentioned that person should be from this status from this family background he should be a maybe gender should be male and so on so forth in this these, these things are there also there are some places which are very much liberal point of view we see like those requirements are not there only krishna the devotion to the krishna is the only requirement and so on so i just want to ask from that perspective, when uh, some there are some points in the scriptures for which there are some uh, 
contradictory statements are there also like so i'm just wanted to ask like how okay. it, yeah yes therefore in order to understand the vedas we need guru because the guru can 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 give us the the right perspective to understand the apparent contradictions like for example now you were speaking about the the varna ashrama which which Srila Prabhupada mentions in, in, the, in the lecture in Conway Hall, the introduction of the Ishopanishad. So he says our definition is Arnashrama, but also Arnashrama in Kali Yuga sometimes may be rejected. And, and the statement is given that in Kali Yuga, just take shelter of the holy name and of Bhakti, and that will do. So Actually, both statements are correct, but the principle that Bhakti and Harinama is higher than Varna Ashrama is very clear. This, is, this was taught by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in the conversations with Ramananda Roy. We find it in chapter eight of Madhya Lila, Chaitanya Charitamrita. So, there may be different levels, we could say hierarchies of gradual understanding of the ultimate truth. And then when we come to Krishna and Shuddha Bhakti, pure devotional service, we're coming to the essence of the Vedas. But in order to properly understand the Vedas, we need Guru and Sadhu. And therefore, Narottam Das Thakur has sung in his Prema Bhakti Chandrika, uh, Guru, Guru Shastra Sadhu Bhakya, or Sadhu Shastra Guru Bhakya, uh, Chitate Koriya Aikya. So that we should make, build up our consciousness or our heart with instructions of Shastra. Vedic scriptures, sadhu, holy persons, and guru. And the sadhu and the guru will help us to use the Vedas in the better way. It is like, for example, to give a modern, modern illustration, if I buy a new computer, very sophisticated, or somebody gives, if it is a present to me, like now I'm using this MacBook, which is not anymore very sophisticated. But some years ago, I got it and it was accustomed to use PC. So I didn't know how to use um, the MacBook properly. I, got, I, have an, I had an idea, but I got help from a devotee who was expert in computers. And I got the most. And I'm sure that there are many details that if I will be trained by an expert, I will be able to, to do that I'm not doing with, with this machine. Of course, I'm using I'm using it as I need it, and if I don't need more, so I, I don't have to, to worry. But if I will want to 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 use it for more things than I'm using it now, I, I might do well to get advice from a computer expert who knows how these machines work. Similarly, in order to use the Vedas, we need expert spiritual master gurus who are devotees who, who, who came the conclusion of the Vedas in order to get the most of these sacred texts. <coughs> Is that okay? Yes, Maharaj, that was helpful. Thank you. <coughs> Any other questions regarding today's topic, which was an overview and particularly contextualizing the Ishopanishad within the Vedas. 
something important we didn't mention, it, which is there in Srila Prabhupada's commentaries, is that the Sri Upanishad is associated with one of the four Vedas. Who remembers who have read which one of the four? Rik Sama Yajur or Atarva? Before we mention that the Upanishads are connected to the to, to one of the four Vedas, the Bhagavad Gita is associated to the Mahabharata, so it's considered part of the fifth Veda. Mahabharata and the Puranas are considered the fifth Veda. So from the four original Vedas, Rig, Sama, Yajur, and Atarva, Srila Prabhupada explains the Upanishad is associated with one of them. If you have not read it, it's okay, I can, I can mention it. It is actually the Yajur Veda. I will write, write it on the chat. Yajur Veda. Oops, um, yes, or Steve, or everyone. So to, tomorrow, because the time is almost two hours, it's only four minutes left. So we will do the reading of the, all the, the verses from the Upanishad in the beginning of tomorrow's section. And then we will move in onto the invocation. So you can prepare for tomorrow. If, we, if you didn't read the introduction, please do so and read also the invocation. And tomorrow we will explore the, the teachings of the invocation. Any final questions or comments for today? Okay, so it seems we are, we are done. It's okay if we finish four, three minutes before it's fine. So tomorrow we meet at 7 p.m. Indian time, sharp, by Krishna's grace. Uh, thank you very much. Hare Krishna, all glories to Srila Prabhupada. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.